guess it just reminds us of the fallen nature of humans. Find a cause you can champion as if it is the champion of freedom because you're not actually fighting for freedom. So instead you wave the blue and yellow flag as if it's the American flag. Okay, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't brought that back up in a long time, but now that I put myself back there, those were really defining moments that are imprinted on my soul. Like, how do you talk to your children about your service in a world gone completely crazy? Pete Hagseth, welcome to Battleground, man. It's great to have you as one of my very first guests. What's up, Sean? Thanks for having me, man. It's great. Great to see you. Yeah, man. It's Look, I've been watching you for a long time. Actually, I've known you for a long time. And you know, you and I worked together back at Concerned Vets for America and building that, building that organization into what I thought was a, a powerhouse of a veterans policy organization. Uh, then you were a Fox News contributor. Then now you're the host of Fox and Friends. And you're just doing all kinds of amazing stuff. You've got a, a, it's a couple amazing books out. Well, first one was what in the arena. Next one was uh, Battle for the American Mind, which was a, it was a, it was a near a legit New York Times bestseller, right? I th- you think you were number one on yeah. Amazon for a while. Yeah, it was it was number one in the Times list for a month, which was pretty, I mean pretty cool that you know they didn't want it there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I remember, I remember, I remember watching you you know because we we've kept in contact for throughout this whole time but i remember watching you walk into trump tower i think like like the daily beast or something had 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 some sort of picture of you like the bigfoot picture of you walking sideways into trump tower i'm like what the hell is this guy up to now because pete's everywhere and there was this you were you were up for consideration for va secretary when president trump won in 2016 and so uh it's been pretty amazing to watch that journey, man, and and be your friend all throughout that time. Um, and and of course, well, we're just a couple, we're the just most couple important... of knuckleheads stumbling along, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just trying to swinging away, trying to fight the fight any way we can. Yeah, man, and that that's like I, I that's what's sort of so amazing about you is because you are a, a, a you're a grunt, man. You're a knuckle dragger. You're an infantry guy like me stationed in i mean you were deployed to afghanistan iraq and guantanamo bay so the big three and and i just sort of wanted to ask you like so and you went to ivy league ivy league education i feel like you had the world at your fingertips for such a long time why the hell even decide to join the military but not just the military like you went into the infantry as well because it seemed like to me you don't go into the infantry unless you want to be a door kicker well yeah you uh you give me a lot of credit, but it was your book and reading it uh, along with Bellavia's, David Bellavia's book uh, was a huge motivator for me to, to start to put uh, words on the page as well. I mean, if people haven't read your book, they need to. Uh, it's unbelievable in understanding real combat. Uh, Thanks, and man. what was it? 435 days or whatever, whatever it was of sustained combat. Um, almost nobody you and I both know has ever gone through that type of thing. Uh you know, I had I had no background in the military. No one in my family uh, was in the military uh, for the most part. I mean, grandfathers in peacetime, World War II, that kind of thing. And I coming out of high school, I almost went to West Point, but I wasn't ready to commit to that yet. I just and frankly, Princeton had a better basketball team, and that's all I cared about at that uh, at that age. Till about the age <laughs> of twenty, I thought I was going to be in the NBA, and that quickly came to a screeching halt. Um, My dad was a basketball coach, so it's all I ever did. And then, you know, I just, from from childhood, and I talk about this a lot, different civic rituals, parades, events, kind of imprinted on my heart that service to country was something of value. Look at these men walking down Main Street in a 4th of July parade or a Veterans Day parade. Like, people really respect them. Whatever they did as young men, uh, I should be willing to do because it seems special and important. And that was... Really it, like that plus just the patriotism of my family, it felt like. And then, you know, there's some movies that come along that motivate you to Saving Private Ryan, stuff like that. You watch, you're like, man, I I need to do my part. And so I went to Princeton, but I didn't enroll in ROTC right away. And then and then it just was, it was eating at me. I just knew it was something I wanted to do. So I signed up in May of 2001 and then uh, 9-11 happened and it was the ultimate validator. It was like, okay, this is, of course, I'm where I should be. And then I did well in my training. So you get to pick your branch if you do well. And 
I, I, for me, it's just like you, if I'm going to do this, let's do this. Uh, yeah. and <laughs> so it, it, infantry was the, uh, was the choice. And, and, um, you know, I mean, it's the ultimate test and, and I think you saw it rawer than, than anybody. I mean, I was an infantry platoon leader, but you did it for 400 days in sustained combat. I mean, the humanity, the leadership, the, the way it tests you. Um, my first tour was not in combat. It was in the, actually in the national guard in Guantanamo Bay for a year. Uh, half of my platoon was twice my age and most of them from totally different backgrounds than me. It was entirely mundane, day shift, night shift, day shift, night shift. You're 90 miles from Cuba. Um, and yet, and the other side of Guantanamo Bay is a naval base where everyone can have their families. But we were on deployment uh, in the detention facility side, living in tin cans and calling uh, on at and <laughs> phones for a buck 50 a minute. You know what I mean? It was like yeah. psychologically yeah. Uh, messed with us. And so trying to lead through that, very different than combat, but when you come out of college, you don't have leadership skills per se, other than maybe sports <laughs> and taught yeah. me a lot about what I know, what I knew and I didn't know, didn't know, but uh, man, it, I'm, I'm grateful every day. The best education I've ever got was definitely not at Princeton. It was from the places we went and the guys I served with, no doubt. Well, I guess, how do you wrap your mind around the awesome responsibility of, of taking charge of America's sons and daughters? And you're not just their leader, but every decision that you make could forever alter the trajectory of, of their lives. And God forbid you make a bad one, you know, your people are going home in body bags. And so, and it's not like you're 45 years old and, you know, as a young platoon leader and have all the, the leadership experience to back up, you know, the street cred to back up your, that position. As you mentioned, like a lot of the dudes that you had around you, probably their boots and t-shirts probably had more experience yeah. in the <laughs> army than you did, you know? And so how do you, as, as an American, somebody who values this country and values the men and women that you serve with, how do you wrap your mind around that awesome responsibility of, of leadership? Man, I think, and you know this better than I do, I, I spent a lot of time leaning on the guys whose boots and T-shirts uh, saw more, had more experience than I did. I mean, you turn to your <laughs> – not you yeah. do. You turn to your non-commissioned officers. You turn to your E5s, your E6s, and your E7s uh, who've already had a combat tour. By the time I went to Iraq, the guys I'd served with, almost all of which had been in combat. And if you run in thinking you have the answers or your instincts are, first of all, if you have any dose of humility, your instincts tell you I'm way out of my depth. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. And, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is, I have no idea what to do. And there's a <laughs> lot of men around me that I respect and they look at me to make the decision. So it's, it's first leaning. And then for me, it was being hyper prepared, not over prepared mm -hmm. to the point where you're micromanaging everything, but. You know, I'll never forget the first air assault raid we did in Baghdad, you know, night raid on an Al Qaeda target. And, you know, we got the mission with about 36 hours lead time and uh, that we had identified the location, you know, time kind of TBD could move up, could move back, depends on things. And mm -hmm. I just poured into it. Like, I don't know. I don't know that neighborhood. We were actually, it was not our, 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 um, our AO. It was not our battle space. So we were sort of uh, getting air assaulted into someone else's. So I didn't know the neighbor didn't know. So it was like, okay, immerse myself for, you know, basically every waking hour before that mission, because the feeling is there. It's like, if, if I don't know, if, if, if I don't have the answers or I haven't done my research and something goes sideways, it's on me. And it's the lives of these men that are on me and they're going to look to me. Uh, and, and, that becomes very real once it is really real and you you know that so and thankfully of course what can go wrong does go wrong sean as you know so yeah. <laughs> they this first night air assault raid they drop us off 300 meters in the wrong spot in the middle of a mud field you envision yourself like getting off on a grassy field like behind me like you're getting off like joe cool like here we go here we go and instead they drop you in a mud field and it's like pfft, yeah. <laughs> on top of each other it's like the least tactically sound um uh, exfil you've ever seen but you you then, then the guys are looking around realizing this is not i'm looking down my gps is not is not really working the way i would like it to so then it is it's back to infantry officer basic course and i'd done the research and spent the time to study the maps in the ao so by terrain associating i was able to say okay i think we're here and we were supposed to be there 
we're behind in our timeline because we're further away. So I've got to make a decision to skirt the road instead of going in this, you know what I mean? But, and I, and frankly, prayer from my mother, which is a whole nother story. I felt a sense of calm that I probably shouldn't have, but it, when you prepare, then when that moment comes and you've thought it through, you don't panic. You don't have to, you know, use your radio and say, I don't know where I am. Take a moment, take a beat, confer with your NCOs. You built a good plan. Everybody knows what it is and you go. So I, I, I just think you you feel the weight of the awesome responsibility. And then if if you've been trained properly, which we have been, then you just use the training, you pour into it because you just don't want to come back and say, I didn't know or I didn't put, prepare enough. Man, I mean, there's just so much there. And, it, you know, when you're when you're on that bird and you're jumping into the shit and, you, you know, as you said, things that can go wrong often do and as a young leader you know you try to prepare for for everything you know and the enemy at the end of the day gets a vote and so that's always weighing on the back of your mind and i remember you know my faith you know and i'm not, I, you know i i'm i'm catholic i'm religious i believe in god and jesus and i pray and but i'm not the most religious guy in the world but my faith was there with me almost every moment and you're right it does give you this sense of of calm in the middle of that chaos and you, and i think so so much of it pete is like you almost do everything that you can to plan for a great mission right but then you just sort of like like Carrie Underwood style, let Jesus take the wheel you know there's yes. there's there's a higher power out there and you put your trust in that as well. You have to, you have to make a reckoning with your creator when, if you don't, it's just like if you're, if you're deployed and you're too tied to what's happening back home, you're sort of bifurcated in your commitment to what's happening there. If you're, if you're out there mm -hmm. saying this whole, you know, I'm scared to die. Of course we all are. There's no doubt. Every there's that mm -hmm. there's, but if that's the, it's kind of like COVID not to get political, but you know, if your whole world is wrapped on self-preservation because I'm scared to die because I don't have faith in anything bigger than myself, everything gets a lot mm -hmm. scarier. There is a point where you make a reckoning with, with uh, your Lord and Savior saying, hey, it is in your hands. I'm planning, but I know that, and, and you know this from combat. You've seen it. I've seen it. One step left instead of a step right. I can think of IEDs that exploded on the Humvee behind me, but not on mine. I can think of RPGs <laughs> yeah. that went off on a vehicle next to mine, but not mine. Guys that were shot at hit near me, but not me. It could have been me. It could have been you. There, there's no difference between that person and me and sheer luck and God's grace. I mean, that's Man. it's one bullet separates Veterans Day from Memorial Day. That's And it's not it's... because... I'm so much better or you're so much better. So it faith plays a huge role in being able to reconcile that when you're in the middle of it. I Pete, man, I totally agree. You know, this, this for the phrase, which to guys like me and you, I feel like is a little bit cliche. Like there are no atheists in foxholes, you know? And the, the great irony of that is that I had some atheists in my platoon that I feel like at mo at, at, there were times in combat where they were like, Jesus, get me out of here, you know. Um, but <laughs> you're you right, get me like out of here. Yeah, yeah. Like if you to if like that bifurcation, and it, and you're man, you're so right because there was there was a, there was a moment for me that has stuck with me every day, Pete. Where you know my uh, these little cousin Freddie was writing me letters um, when I was a platoon leader in Afghanistan. We were about six months into our tour. And he, this was like July 4th. I get this letter from him. It's this little cartoon picture that he had drawn for me of this soldier in fatigues with the American flag. And we had just got back from this mission where we had just gotten our asses whipped, not by the enemy. We just got hit by indirect fire for what felt like hours. And when you're, when you, there's nothing worse than, than being attacked by indirect fire. And that's like artillery and mortars for people that are watching. But it's like, at least when you're face to face with the enemy, you see where they are, you, you know, you can shoot back. But when you're getting pounded by artillery and mortars, like you're just like, like, it's just chance. You just hunker down in, in, in your truck or in a bunker or in a hole somewhere in a ranger grave and hope one doesn't land in your head. So we came back from that mission and I was just, 
I was just, I was physically smoked, but I was emotionally sp- smoked too, yeah. man. And I remember looking at this picture and thinking like, okay, that bifurcation that you were talking about, like I can't as a leader exist in both worlds. I have to sort of shut off everything that's happening at home because to think about home is to hope to be home and, you know, to go to the pirates games and the Steeler games and to smell the hot dogs. And, you know, you, you dream of the family at that point in my life that I didn't have yet, but I know that I wanted, you know, but to think about that stuff when you're there in the shit, it's just, it distracts you from the mission at hand. And if you're distracted, that can lead to other people dying around you. Big time, big time. It's, you know, same, it, same with the short timer effect, which is as old as time. It, it, you know, it's, well, it's actually a more new phenomenon because we now do, you know, if we went back to the old World War II model of you're in it till you win it, uh, we might be in better shape in some. Pl- I mean, problem is winning. It's very different. And I, that's sort of a nice ideal. But y- you really have to fight it in those last two weeks when you're there to say, OK, no, I have to go out. I have to go out because the unit that's with me needs me to be out there. And I, you know, why would I stop now? And, you know, it, it is it's not just psychological warfare with your enemy. It's psychological warfare with yourself. And and you can tell as a leader, both yourself, especially because, you know, in Iraq, you could you could when I was there at least oh five oh six, I was in you know, we were in a remote fob, but enough where you could pay the locals to get you internet if you really wanted it. And, yeah. you know, they, you know what I mean? Like there was enough do, ways yeah. to work around. So, so you really had to fight the, the, the temptation to want to gravitate toward a battle rhythm of staying in touch with people when you knew it was unhealthy for what you're doing. And mm-hmm. so basically tried to set it aside as like maybe once a week over here, as opposed to, you know, cause you'd see guys sort of sink into a, a black hole of, Oh, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to people today or yesterday. And that sends them down. It's like, mm-hmm. whoa, that that's not going to work. Be, it, it, but it's, it, it's got to be more difficult now on in, you know, in future iterations of combat where co- communication is instant with instant. anywhere all, all the time, like that split. That's why, that's why, frankly, I have, I came back from combat with so much more appreciation for, uh, first responders and police who never have it, the ability never to leave. shut it off in either direction here at home. So Absolutely, yeah, that's a challenging man. part of it. Do you ever look back? Cause I know I sure as hell know that I do. Do you ever look back and, and about, and think about some of the experiences that you had in Afghanistan and Iraq and Guantanamo Bay and, and think like, okay, I know that that's my life. I know that I lived those experiences, but damn, does it seem surreal. Like, <laughs> how did I make it? Because you're talking about, like, the difference between Veterans Day and Memorial Day is one bullet with your name on it, man. And that is so powerful, but it's also so true. So do you ever think back, like, yeah, man, that's my life, but damn, I can't believe I lived it? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think it's part of the the, the – the thing that we never anticipate, but happens to all of us, you, you just get older. <laughs> you know what I mean? People go, when did you serve in Iraq? And I'm like, whoa, 17 years ago. How I know. Old am I? I know. <laughs> you know? And then, but that also, it also, I think about how much I still don't know as a 42 year old man now and how, how much I really didn't know as a 25 year old leading a platoon uh, in Iraq. And that's frankly part of the upside of it is that you don't, you know, you're not old enough to know how stupid some of the things you're about to do probably are. And you, you, you've been trained to think you can do them. And, and as a result, you, you can do them, but mm-hmm. it is, it is surreal. I mean, I guess, I guess that's part of why a lot of guys didn't talk about it in previous generations. And then pretty soon, I don't want to be talking about it as the only thing that defines me. I, exactly. I, it's not that I put it on a shelf or I say, Oh, you know, I'm trying to block it away. Yeah, we did that. And every once in a while, moments like this, or I'd say it happens every year and a half or something, someone will want to have a sincere conversation about for someone you respect who wants to go a little deeper on some stuff. And it's it's like, OK, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't brought that back up in a long time. But now that I put myself back there, those were really defining moments that are imprinted on my soul. But I really just kind of put them over there and mention that it happened. And I've I wanted to use those as a 
not not as a stepping stone, but they're part of the foundation of who you become as a person. And I'd, I'd like to think they, you know, think of the storms you've gone through. Think of the fights that you've had. I mean, mm-hmm. without those fights in the hills of Afghanistan, you're not fortified and prepared to deal with other things. And I, so I'd like to think that's all part of the fabric of what makes us who we are. And, and that's why somebody calling me a name on TV, I'm like, okay, like, <laughs> whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, we've all seen it. worse and have experienced worse. So, but it is, it is surreal. It is. And I, and I guess you manage it by not thinking about it all that much because it was a long time ago and I was a younger man and it's on to different fights. I mean, it's, it's so true. Like I see men and women who come home. I mean, being a warrior, an American warrior is something that at a certain point in time in my life that defined who I was, but like you, I haven't moved on from it. Right. I've just maybe shifted fire a little bit. Like I know that that is always going to be a core part of of who I am. But I see so many men and women come home from the fight and they get stuck in that identity and then they start spinning their wheels and they never really focus on what the next mission is. And, you know, so much of I think when a veteran comes home and transitions from war is 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 a is identifying what that next mission is going to be and sort of braiding it with your purpose, right? If you can figure oh, out sure. a way, you can figure out a way to do that. It becomes rocket fuel, and you just move out and draw fire onto the ne- next objective. And and for you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you've always been in the fight, whether it was on the battlefields of Iraq of Afghanistan or even here at home. My sense of you, Pete, is that you've always been involved in the direction of this country in the understanding that in order to keep freedom that we have here in this country it has to be fought for by every generation and oh, it sure I does some- i mean i yeah I, I mean i stumbled into it i mean i wasn't very political when i showed up in college and then i looked around i'm like wow y- y'all are lunatics okay yeah. what is this gender <laughs> is a social construct yeah. or my religion teacher is like you know what jesus was not uh, crucified on a cross and he was most likely uh, buried in a shallow grave and eaten by dogs. I was like, mm, interesting. F- um, yeah, that's, <laughs> like, you're my absolutely insane. Teacher. So you, it was, it was more a reaction to like, whoa, I, I got to do something about this, and and so yeah, I did get interested in advocating for the things that I believe, if, if inartfully, and I didn't have all the answers, and maybe that's a testament to just. Sometimes you charge ahead. You're not going to have every answer. You're not going to get everything right, but action breeds opportunities. And so by standing up and being willing to say, I, I stand for something, it prepares you for the next time you have to stand up and stand for something. Uh, and, but, but you're right. There, there's no doubt that um, when, when I came home from Iraq, I had this attitude of, all right, don't talk to me. I've done my part. You know, like yeah. I, 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 can, I can throw <laughs> I that. Do. Now that I've been there, done there, got the T-shirt and all of that, I'm, you know, no one can question my loyalty to this country for the rest. And no one can question my manhood. And I'm, I'm you know, I, I know I was there. My guys know I was there and they know what they did. That lasts as a satisfying feeling for like two months, you know, and <laughs> as you bellied up to the bar and internalized all this muck that you're still dealing with. And you've told a few stories here or there. And then, and that's where it either goes you either start to identify that next chapter of purpose or it goes south. And for me, it went south for a while. I mean, just no doubt. And thankfully there were good people and um, other guys I served with. And frankly, I had the benefit of, that's where the benefit of going to Princeton was there. Like there were networks of people that reached out and said, mm-hmm. can I help you? And like, I, you know, so many guys we serve with would never have access to that. And they go back to their hometown or to their families great families, great hometowns, and they're great guys. And they look at the opportunities in front of them there compared to what they were doing in the military. And it's, it's baffling to find that next chapter it's of purpose. True. And, I mean, and I th- it's, it's hard. It's so true. It, it's, it is hard. And you, t- you think like, think about it, like almost existentially, it's like you have, you join the military and you become a part of the greatest military force the world has ever known. I, I truly believe that there's not been a military force in this world that rivaled that of the United States of America. And you go from that prestigious warrior culture. If you're an enlisted guy, you know, as you said, not most enlisted guys don't go to, don't go to Princeton for their undergrad, you know, and those people transition out 
And and I know because I've had conversations with them where they go from Absolutely. being the, the best mortarman in the battalion, which is a huge, a huge honor, uh, to to being offered a job flipping burgers at McDonald's. And and it's not that there's anything wrong with that. There's honor in in work and in, in working to provide for yourself and for your family, but it it's not the same as you know, putting that American flag on your shoulder. And fighting for a country that that you love, you believe you believe is exceptional, and coming home and flipping burgers—it's just an yeah, it's a transition well, it's also, that most Americans are unaware unaware of. I think absolutely right. And and sometimes you know they uh, civilian might ask, well, why don't they just stay in and be the mortarman? And if that's such yeah. a big chapter of purpose, and you and I both know, like the meat grinder that is military service, whether it's multiple deployments, whether it's the psychological part of it, whether it's interpersonal dynamics, whether it's bad leadership, um, you know, there are so many things that can poison the well of really good soldiers who then say, you know what, I thought I wanted to make it a career, but I'm on my way out. And, and it's different exactly. for, for everybody or a, or a promotion structure that actually isn't all that merit based. And it's a lot more time based than it should be. And so it's demoralizing and they, so they leave thinking, all right, I've done my part there, you know, on to greener pastures. And it's, it's just not that, that simple. And, you know, you've done a lot of work with veterans organizations to try to address that. It's what we talk about all the time when we did it is find that chapter of purpose. And it can be being a husband and a, and a, and a father too, and passing it on as you get older. That's hard to realize when you're that age. I mean, I'm, when you're younger, you don't realize how much your legacy really isn't anything other than what you pass on to your kids. And what, I mean, really isn't, I I can see my daughter through the window over here. She's five. And it made me think of, (laughs) um, no, it made me think of, so she only knows me basically as a 40 year old man will never know the 25 year old that deployed and will only look at pictures of a man she never knew because she doesn't recognize him that young, you know? And so my, 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 her view of me is not going to be based on what I did in uniform. And my value to her is going to be whether or not I teach her the things she needs to be the type of Christian mother, wife, citizen that our Republic and Western civilization is going to need to perpetuate itself in a world gone absolutely mad uh, of, uh, and that is totally upside down. That's just hard for a 26 year old kid who was the best mortarman in the company to come home and, okay, I'm going to pour into my family. They go, what do you mean I'm going to pour into a family? Like I got to get a job. I got to, you know, what, what? And so it's, it's we we just got to keep encouraging guys to be there for other guys and fight for the military to be better at that transition process and the VA is a disaster that's not the answer at least not right now and um and help outside organizations that help guys heal and transition and and how so you talked about the importance of family and and your daughter and you know legacy and i have to tell you that was something that was on my mind in Afghanistan every day, mm. you know, because you grapple with these ideas of, okay, of, of just absolute finality in death, which could happen at any second, you know? And I found myself thinking on more than, than one occasion, like if I die over here, right? I mean, if, you know, will, will my family be sad? Of, co- of course they will. But everything that I was, that I am and ever will be is gone from this earth forever and what will my legacy be like i don't even have kids to pass on a legacy to and so now that i've come home and i've got a family and 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 i've got amazing kids and in fact we're blending a family and and that comes with it a whole lot of other challenges that you Mm -hmm. sort of don't plan doing the same thing i know you are i know um but how do you do that pete like how do you talk to your children about your service and in, in, in the and in, in, you're right in a world gone completely crazy about what it means to be an American and teach them that that freedom is a very fleeting thing man I just think I think I think we can take nothing for granted in today's society so yes you can you know, it's, it's conversations, it's dinner table, it's bedtime, it's long car rides. It's, you know, the places where you get a chance in that moment to dig deep with your kid and dive into their, the development of their soul and how they view the world. 
But, the, you know, you're a busy guy. I'm a busy guy. Let's be honest. If you're relying on those moments only, you're, 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 you're in some ways chipping at the margins, especially once they become teenagers with devices and different friend networks, and then they move off. I mean, so I, I, I think we're at a moment where you can't, unless you know exactly what the institution your kids, where they're going to school, exactly what they believe and what they're committed to, um, they could be awash in worldviews that are completely antithetical mm -hmm. to everything that you believe in. And because it used to be that the church and the community and the school and the family, they all kind of through osmosis, especially if you lived in a more conservative area, were reinforcing each other. And we just you just can't rely on that anymore. And so, I mean, this is my backyard, exactly. by the way, here. It's part of it. Uh, and we <laughs> we moved to Tennessee <laughs> specifically for that reason because we had our kids in a school that was okay and but you know new jersey just put all these mandates for transgender you know education yeah. down to first grade or whatever crazy i did research crazy. for battle for the american mind i traveled across the country visiting schools we found i mean i know not everybody can do this so i i this comes with a giant caveat but we found a school we love and we moved to it and we said that's exactly the type of education i want for my kids to be poured into them as they become and in the hopes that they will become future culture warriors, because that's what we're going to need. Not survivors of the culture no who sort of whisper, whisper to you that like, oh, yeah, I believe there's only two genders. Do you? Oh, OK, cool. Yeah. You know, yeah. like they, they got to be prepared to be fortified, to stand up for what they believe in. And, and, and then maybe if they want to take the next step to serve. Great. But that's that is, you know. Even then, I'm worried about the military and what it stands for right now. So that's a whole other conversation. Uh, it's a whole other yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a whole other exactly. conversation where it's heading. But I just it, it is it has become the burden of my heart to find those ways because I my parents did a great job and they took us to church and loved us and cared for us and I had the privilege of two parents who were together and there's just no doubt about it. Yeah, but I do think well, they were able to take for granted the fact that we were going to learn that stuff that they wanted us to learn. They were never mm. political or even intentionally cultural about a lot of things. They were great, but that was, didn't have to be. I think we have to be now if we want to pass I, I mean, to the next generation. I to I, first of all, you know, you know where I stand on this. I totally agree. And I think as being a parent, like so much of, of being a father or being a parent is, I mean, God, man, like you sort of learn as you go, right? There's, there's, there's lots of books yes. written about, you know, what to expect when, when expecting and lots of, lots of books that, that talk about, you know, how to be a good parent, but really a lot of it is just, you learn as you go. And I think one of the things that I've learned over time is you're not going to have, I mean, we're busy people, as you mentioned, and, and, and that's not something that's unique to us. Lots of parents are busy. Nope. And so you almost have to embody what you want your children to become. So if if it is fighting for this country and teaching them about what it means to be an American and what it means to be free and what it means to be a culture warrior with going into that with the understanding that people are going to despise you, but it is what's necessary to stand up to the the modern day progressive left. Like this ain't your this ain't my grandfather's Democrat party anymore. Like yep. The, yep. one of the things that I, I've, I've recognized as I've sort of grown up and grown into this political world that we live in today. I mean, everything is political, even even late night TV is political, which I loathe. But um, I, you have to go into it as a conservative, understanding the importance of, of culture. And I think Republicans, by and large, have ceded culture to Democrats for the better part of 50 years, much to our detriment. And. It, it, so much of what I see out of Republicans who either want to run for office or even incumbents who've been in office in the House or in the Senate for a lifetime is they want the adoration of the media and the celebrities. <laughs> but you guess what? It doesn't matter how much you try to ingratiate yourself with that community, Pete. It's never going to happen. And you have to no. go into it with the understanding that that that's going to be the case. Absolutely. And and the, the sooner you internalize that and realize if they have, are my enemy, then I'm doing the right things, the better the better place you are. And and yeah. to, to the previous part of that, too, it's kind of weird. I, I don't know if I, I, I'm I'm guessing other generations had this feeling, too. Certainly not the World War Two generation. They came out of it very optimistic about the future. And, and other generations have had, you know, a, ebbing and flowing senses of, of optimism and and a pessimism. But looking at 
the fissures and fractures inside our culture and our country right now, looking at this, the, this, the state of higher education, of media, of, of big corporations, certainly of academia, um, you know, social media, all of those have been complete <laughs> government have been completely corrupted to their core or taken over by the hard left. I, I look totally. at my kids and I say, I don't know what's in store for you. I really don't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 40. Who knows what our Republic's going to look like in five or 10 or 15 years. And you and I are going to be a part of hopefully, you know, leading the charge for things that are good and right and true that, that stand for the ideals this nation was founded on. I, you, you're committed to that. I'm committed to that. If, if that's my life's work, great. Uh, and it could go well and it could go sideways, but I've, feel like for my kids it's gonna go sideways at some point because you can't maintain the absolute sort of ongoing fissure slash underground divorce that we have in our culture where half the country thinks we're the greatest country in human history and the other one thinks we're the worst country in human history and then we don't have faith in our elections anymore because of the way that's been changed and we don't have faith in our intelligence agencies anymore and certainly are electing you know, more hardcore Republicans and more hardcore Democrats and for, for totally understandable reasons. At some point that that reaches a breaking point, which history shows us is not a good one. And I don't welcome I, that. I don't want that. But I, I agree. I see that for my kids and I go, either you're going to be the one who puts their head in the sand and tries to make a buck or figure it out or shelter their family, or you're going to be someone who is, you know, putting their shoulder to the plow. And I want shoulders on the plow whenever that moment comes. I mean, no doubt. I mean, and, and who knows what the future has in store for our children? Hell, our country could be broke by then. And you look at like what's yeah. happening with this one point seven trillion dollar omnibus spending bill, four thousand plus pages. Dan Bishop had a thread on it in Twitter and all the stuff that we we waste money on. You know, for example, four hundred and ten million to border security for other countries like Lebanon, Egypt, Oman. But and funding for our, our border police, as long as they're not using that funding to actually secure the border, which to me is just it's just crazy. You know, we're wasting all of this money uh, at a time where Americans. Th this is this is where I have a, a real s a problem with both Republicans and Democrats. Right? Do they recognize the things that we're talking about? Because it seems like D.C. And, and Washington and those inside the Beltway are just on autopilot and they've learned nothing from what President no, I don't think Trump, I think, represented. I mean, I mean it's at, crazy. Look, at, it's crazy. I mean, Mitch McConnell is hell bent on cutting a deal with Nancy Pelosi so he doesn't have to deal with Kevin McCarthy because he'd rather deal with Nancy Pelosi. Be, I mean, Trump. The further we get away from Trump's presidency, the more it is, we, we should realize, again, the anomaly that was his candidacy and presidency. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it makes me want that moment back because you get it and you have it and you go, OK, yeah, I, I see that. And then the further you get away from it, you realize, no, that was an affront to everything that the institutions, the bureaucracies stood for, and they hid back and waited as long as they could to try to wait him out or take him out so they could go back to business as usual, which is right. really to sell out our country on either side. It's, and and it's, Pete, it's not sustainable. It's crazy. I mean, it's, it's not sustainable. No, it's crazy. And you're it's right. The, you're so right. The further we get away from, from the Trump presidency, and I think his presidency, look, love President Trump or hate him. I was, I was a huge supporter. Everybody that's watching this knows that, but like, it taught us a lot about where we are. Totally. And the further the further we get away from it, the more I see it brings into real focus just how broken Washington is, and that's what he represented. He was a system disruptor. He was an fu to the system, to the status quo, and I think that's what so many Americans, even a lot of blue collar Democrats, who who this country and this economy is just left the working man and woman behind. Trump represented hope to them and, and the idea that the system could change. But the system, again, inside the beltway, Republicans as well, just went after him in a way that I never even thought possible to now. You know, we're talking about releasing President Trump's tax returns, like from what, 2015 mm -hmm. to 2020? Like, 
Yeah. What standard does that set for any politician running for office? I mean, obviously, now that it's happened to Trump, it can happen to any Democrat. Like, how short sighted are some of our, our political leaders? But it won't in happen Washington? to Democrats. That's the scary. It <laughs> yeah. won't happen to Democrats. It is just. I mean, first, first of all, it just happened to Donald Trump. He was such an anomaly that they would stop at nothing to crush him. I think the most revealing moment will be, and I hope it's not 2024 because I hope it's Donald Trump in 2024. But it will be what happens to the next Republican nominee or pre- presidential candidate or Republican who wins the presidency. How are they treated? Was was Trump just a revelation of what they'll do to any Republican, therefore all mm-hmm. political opponents? Or mm-hmm. was he was he just so bad to them that they pulled out all the stops? Not making any of that acceptable at all, by the way. I mean, Trump got 11 million more votes the second time around than he did the first go around. Unbelievable. Let's like how he, that. yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> and we I knew mean, going into that, if, if he were to, if he were going to perform like that, I don't think there's a political pundit in this country that, that said, Hey, Trump's going to, and, and is going to get 11 up. plus million. Yeah. He's going to win bar none. Slammed you up. know, I, I mean, yeah, we ran and, into, we ran into the difference between voters and ballots and that's a whole that's other exactly right. But and, and, and so, and so <laughs> speaking of Congress, not learning anything like something that, that just boggles the mind is you have Zelensky coming in and speaking uh, to Congress, which of course is it correlates to the passing of this omnibus spending bill, uh, which, by the way, like Republicans in the Senate, what the hell are you doing? Like, why? How do you not punt this to oh, to punt. January, where Republicans just control punt. the House, just so that we can have a debate about what is in it? The bill was released at two a.m. yesterday. I think Dan Bishop said that like. To read the entire 4,000 plus page bill, you'd have had to read four pages a minute without a single break for 16 hours. <laughs> so so you have that. You have that dynamic where no Republican or Democrat in Washington could possibly read this bill before they sign off on it. No. To Zelensky speaking on the the floor of the House. And of course, Schumer talked about, oh, I hope Republicans don't take a page out of President Trump's book and his friendship with Putin doesn't put them up. Like, how does this help the dialogue at all? And more more importantly than that, like, what the hell's the mission in Ukraine? What's the end state? We're spending over $100 billion with probably 100 more promised in this omnibus spending bill. Like, where's the money going? What are we using it for? And then never mind the fact that the Biden family has some weird incestuous relationship with the leadership of Ukraine. Like, you know, a fire the prosecutor or you don't get the billion dollars type stuff. Like, yeah. And, and all the while, Pete, all the while, the American people can't put gas in their car and can't afford to put food on their table. I just think the priorities are just totally jacked up. I, I couldn't say it better myself. Everything you laid out is spot on. I mean, it's the opposite of America first. I and mean, that's what Absolutely. Trump threatened the, the international order of, of Council on Foreign Relation, Washington, D.C., Brookings Institute types who just assumed that the, <laughs> the, the, the way exactly. things worked forever in the world will be the way they work. And they were never told their wars were stupid, stupid or their generals were losers or that NATO didn't step up. Or that China, you know, would unleash a virus. So let's call it the China virus and hold them to account for it. All, all, all of those things were a, were a calling out of an international order that was failing and is continuing to fail, and now has a great advocate in the regime currently in the White House. So they go right back to business as usual. And Ukraine, you can't that that Schumer um, statement you mentioned about him sort of talking about Putin is. It's basically a fight Donald Trump by fighting Putin through Zelensky war in Ukraine. Yeah. I mean, it really <laughs> is. Exactly. It's like <laughs> it's their God, ability Dude, to say, that's so true. That is so know, true. They finally found a war they just absolutely love. And it was all over the defense of Europe as if he couldn't even take Kiev. Now he's going to take Europe. And we need to throw the kitchen sink at it, even though he's got a bunch of nukes and could light the world on fire if he wanted to. Uh, and this is the greatest threat to democracy yeah. the world has ever seen. Yet we don't know where a lot of these weapons are going. And we're not even funding our own military. We can't even recruit into our own military, let alone yeah. all the other. And we have a border that we're, we're we're pumping billions to defend a border. And our border is like, 
you know, I, it's come it, on, it's Schumer, come on Schumer, 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 Schumer's up. like, oh, he Zelensky comes to the House floor as the embodiment of freedom itself. Like freedom. We we just heard for for the last week is the Twitter files of the FBI paying American taxpayer dollars to Twitter to then censor Americans whose taxpayer dollars paid for the censorship. Correct. Since when do Democrats care about freedom? Do you, I mean, you remember, I'm sure, uh, many of the fights that we had like over the Iraq war and the war in Afghanistan. And since when are Democrats pro-war? What world do we live in? And you talk about a crazy world where guys like me and you I mean, I'm not anti-war, by, not by a long shot. Like, I understand that freedom needs to be protected, and there are those of us that need to rise up to do it. And God forbid, if there's ever a war where our freedom needs to be protected, it'll be the first one in line going to protect it. But these sort of proxy wars that feed the sort of military-industrial complex, and you talk about the lack of trust in our institutions, like, I'm at a point where I don't trust anything. <laughs> anything that the government I know. is saying and the idea that Zelensky comes to the house floor as the embodiment of freedom is laughable to me well he's banning certain i mean at the same time he's banning certain media outlets and he's banning you know per- certain portions of the church i mean he's consolidating yeah. <laughs> power in some yeah. ways yeah you know, anyway so it's, it's a bit ironic but yeah yeah so here we are in in love with a new war at, that has any series of umpteen unintended consequences fresh off of two wars that spent 20 years and unleashed massive amounts of unintended consequences that our leaders told us were either unimportant or, or, uh, or wouldn't happen. I, it just, it, I guess it just reminds us of the fallen nature of humans, how dumb we really will be forever a- yeah. and how craven for power to your point that, that, that fi- find a cause you can champion as if it is the champion of freedom because you're not actually fighting for freedom, but you know that that's what America's supposed to be premised on. So instead, you you wave the flag, you wave the blue and yellow flag as if it's the American flag, and say that you're a, a patriot. I mean, it's it's so well said. I, yeah, Pete, I, I want to be respectful of your time, uh, it, uh, but I also want to talk about real quickly the life of Jesus and that it's premiering on Fox Nation. And I watched the trailer on your Instagram, and man, it was so powerful. Like the idea that you're there, boots on the ground following his footsteps learning about his life uh did you did you walk the stations of the cross can please tell us a little bit about what that looks like because it looks powerful yeah it was it was humbling it was amazing um um it it uh it's one thing to talk about it we've all read it but to see there to be there um to to see it and to be there and to to be at the very place and we learn more every decade about archaeologically about what correlates with what and where it is i mean yes we did watch walk the stations of the cross we went to where the last supper occurred um we went to you know golgotha it's a big church church of the holy sepulcher but there's also another location uh, that just blows your mind when you're there uh, that mm-hmm. may have been actually been the actual tomb and the stone that was rolled away i mean and it, i get chills just it, you go to the wilderness where jesus was tempted and you realize how vast how hot it was in the day and how cold it was at night and how empty it was and how 40 days and 40 nights for a mere mortal is impossible. The Jordan river where he was baptized. I mean, his hometown where they threw him out of the synagogue and almost threw him off of a cliff. I, it, you know, you've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we've all heard the stories, but when you weave them together and you start to tell almost a chronological story, it gives you a sense of the, the, the gathering storm that was the clash between God on earth, performing miracles, clearly uh, proclaiming the gospel and proclaiming to be the Messiah and religious authorities and others who said, no, this is a heretic. I mean, he's either the, the, the Messiah or he's a false prophet. And and people were choosing sides and you could feel uh, the mounting tension. So this first part of the series, which got released on Fox Nation for Christmas, is from birth to basically up to Holy Week. And then in Easter, we're going to release um the whole holy week stations of the cross uh everything Man. that you see in jerusalem but it, it was it's humbling i mean listen i know i can't tell i mean who, how can you tell the story of jesus christ you can't but yeah. i took a pastor with me and we went to the places where it happened not to say did it happen but we know it happened we think it happened here and here's the scriptures that tell us why it's important pete 
I, it just looks incredible, man. And I, I, how is that brought into perspective? Because I know it does. You know, when you think about your faith, you, you tie it to what's actually happening in the world now. You look at what happened to Jesus and sort of the life and death clashes that happened around his spirituality and the, the kind of person that he was mm -hmm. and leader he became. Having been in the arena myself, you know, like in a complete noob, you know, uh, in terms of like just even running for office, it really – you do see – that there are, you know, spiritual forces at work, not just in this country, but all over the world. And I think the life of Jesus really brings that into perspective and reminds people just how important it is to be on the right side of those things. And has that, has that journey for you in filming this, this special or documentary or whatever you're calling it, has that changed the way that you see the fight or have you always seen it that way? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think it's, it's easy to fight. And what's the right way to put it? You can fight for intellectual reasons because you know something to be true. And, and that's probably the easier mode to, to fight in. And that's probably the instinct that I have at the very least. Going mm -hmm. to Israel and, and seeing this and growing in my faith over the last five, six years going to Israel. I've been eight or nine times, and this was a 10 day trip to do it. Hmm. it. It it's, as my pastor says, it's taken it from the 12 inches from the head to the heart is where most people miss Jesus. Cause it's right up here, but wow. it's not in here and mm -hmm. feeling it and seeing it, touching it, it is, it kind of leaves an imprint that when you're doing your devotions every day, you say, okay, I, I think I understand a little bit more what Jesus meant. Not some special insight. I don't have any special insight. It's just a, a connection to the feeling of what he may have experienced and what he was trying to impart on people. And I, I just, that's what we're trying to do with the film is share that good news of Jesus that we all need because human na nature never changes. I mean, as much as we may want to think we've progressed or no, we are the same fallen sinful souls that Jesus encountered 2000 years ago. And if he walked onto my yard right now and proclaim to be the Messiah, I might deny him the same way people around him who saw miracles denied him. Because there is a spiritual battle on this earth, as you said, every single day. Lies are the most potent weapons of the devil, and we fall for them every day in ways big and small. And so I, the more I, the more I'm out in the public square, have, the more I want to make sure I'm right with him uh, and reconcile. And I think it's something as young people, we just sort of dismiss or we play with at the superficial level. It's part of getting older again, is I, I want to know my creator. I want to have a personal relationship with Jesus that changes my heart so that I have the humility and the, the courage to see what is right or the wisdom to see what is right and the courage to do it. And the humility to know I don't have every answer, but also that um, assurance of heart that we talked about earlier on in the, in the program that you know, if my life were to end today, I, I know that I, you know, I know who I served or who I wanted to be serving and what my purpose was here on earth. That I think if you make your life, your life, the center of your worship, then you start, then, then politics becomes a God and the climate becomes a God and COVID becomes a God and safety becomes a God. And that's why a lot of, you can get really unhappy really fast. And I've had plenty of scars and failures and missteps in my life and if those defined me then i would be sit laying in the yard in a fetal position mm -hmm. but instead i'm you know redeemed by a savior who went through a lot more than that and and gives me a second chance and so i i hope people will watch it for christmas share it with their family and really the people i want to watch it the most sean are, are my kids you know and mm -hmm. they're probably gonna watch it and be like oh dad another program yeah i know the story <laughs> of jesus dad you know, you know yeah. I mean? like i know i'm gonna be utterly disappointed by their reaction to it but i'm hoping in 10 years and they pick it back up or i send it to them and they say oh dad okay now i get it you know and, and it deepens their faith uh if, if we're going to need a deepening of all of our faiths to to deal with what's coming. No question, man. No question. Well, Pete, thanks so much for for coming on Battleground and the the life of Jesus. Watch it on Fox Nation. If you're not a member of Fox Nation, join up, watch it, especially around this time of year. It will be worth it. 
Uh, God bless you, man, and God bless this God bless incredible you. country. Yeah. One, Have a Merry one last Christmas. thing, I just want to say, I just Merry Christmas to you. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the way you fight, the way you fought, and what you've gone through. Uh, and you are a leader that this country needs for decades to come. You're an authentic, real guy who knows what he stands for and has been through the fire. So I couldn't be prouder of where you've been, what you're doing, and how you're doing it. And uh, congrats on this great podcast, and sky's the limit, and appreciate you, man. Merry Christmas. Yeah, thanks, brother. I really appreciate it, man. Take care. You got it.